Thank you for the introduction. And welcome, everybody. I want to thank Materialize for the opportunity to present today. Uh, we've had a long relationship with Materialize at the Pew Synthes, over seven years of success in customized products for personal care. And what they asked me to do today is to present to you on the benefits of 3D printing and digital planning for device manufacturers. What I'm going to do is kind of take a step into what we're doing today in personalized care. And that's, that's pretty much the low-hanging fruit that we hit right away with personalized care was, and using 3D printing. But there's opportunities going forward as well. So we're going to talk about the benefits of the surgeon in our hospitals that we work with, as well as the patients that they treat. And then lastly, we'll take a peek into the future and some of our perspective as to what the future looks like. So it really starts with our personalized care. And we have, with our partnership with Materialize, a very strong uh, portfolio. It runs from that digital imaging and acquisition. And it was great to hear the presentations earlier. Uh, I'm glad to hear some of the perspectives are in line with some of the things you'll hear in our, my presentation. There were questions about imaging and qu imaging, image quality. And it, this is a critical element. And this technology has really grown as imaging has grown. And so we're, we're going to advance as imaging advances as well. So it's, that's a critical element. And our, our, work, our workflow goes all the way through surgical simulation and working with the surgeon to simulate the surgery, optimize the plan, and then taking those plans and using tactile physical guides that are personalized using 3D printing to be able to transfer that virtual plan to the operating room. And lastly, Combining that, those two, with a patient-specific implants, and this is something that the Pew Synthes has done for over 13 years in providing customized implants that really restore the patient's aesthetics as well as function. But again, this is the personalized workflow, and let's take a little deeper dive as to how 3D printing and digital imaging help this. It all starts with this virtual, virtual simulation. It's, it's a web meeting between a surgeon and a clinical engineer. And you're seeing more and more where surgeons are doing this themselves. But this gives the surgeon a great opportunity to be able to optimize the plan and go, come th go through different iterations of the plan. It's a great tool for communication. We heard this earlier, communicating with patients, making sure patients are well-educated so they can make good decisions, both preoperatively as well as a po postoperative plan, as well as communication with the operating room. We've had great conversations between maybe the ablative surgeon, the reconstructive surgeon in cancer cases. And this is this great opportunity to communicate. But this is just vaporware, right? They're just pictures on the screen. How do we take this to the operating room? And this is where 3D printing comes in. Technologies like SLS and materials like nylon have allowed us to take these types of patient-specific guides and put them in the operating room, transferring the plan uh, and, and, and being able to allow surgeons to direct the, uh, a, a screw or the osteotomy of bone or position of bone. 3D printing allows this to be done in a very cost effective as well as timely. I mean, surgeons want this in, in a rapid manner. This is why a lot of these hospitals are doing this themselves. Can you do it faster and more cost effective? This is important in getting these things faster, and 3D printing has enabled this. Lastly, is the use of tactile models. And you've seen this in previous presentations. And I shouldn't put this as last because this was the first element, right? We, did, we used models first. But models are still used. I would say when we first started our relationship with Materialize five years ago, I thought this was going to go away. I said, they're all going to do this virtually. We're going to have haptic. We're not going to be doing this with models. And it's a business that's still grown. It is great to see that new materials have come out and then also new applications in cardiac, thoracic as well as spinal surgery. So I loved the presentations earlier, seeing new applications on how this can really improve patient care, where it can be used as a communication tool between the surgeon and their patients. Why personalize? Why do we do this? And so it's, to, the answer I always give is that it's really started with the head, because when you walk down the street and one person's eye is a millimeter lower than the other, you will notice it. You will stare at that. People want to be restored properly. They want to have proper function. The face is the area of not just aesthetics, but the, it's also the area of breathing, eating, speaking. All this has to work, right, and look good. And I, what I see is 100, 150 un unique individuals in this audience that need maybe a unique solution. And that's why personalized care is really taken off in CMF. But we've, because of function and other improvements in better outcomes, you've seen this 
also grow in joints, hips, knees, and then also now you're seeing with anatomic models with spine and cardiac. So there's great opportunities to be able to use these, te these technologies. Now for our TrueMatch uh, CMF products, we're built on a, a value proposition that has three pillars. One is efficiency, and you've heard these terms before, and Brigitte brought some of these up earlier, and OR efficiency is, is critical. We wanna make sure that the, this element, which is just cutting bone and positioning bone, is the fastest part of the process. Have you ever seen a, a, a cancer resection and maybe with a, micro, or a microvascular procedure, you want our part to be the fastest. Microvascular takes pretty long to do, and we want ours to be the quickest and most efficient. And with some of these uh, autographed uh, solutions, you know, a part of the body was maybe a fibula one day, and now it's gonna be a mandible the next. And so we wanna make sure it right, it's right and it looks like a mandible going forward, and that's why we do that. Accuracy is critical, and so we wanna make sure this looks right and it's, we are able to transfer the virtual plan. There's, there's money being spent on this, there's a value prop, we want to make sure that when it's done, it's done right and done right the first time. And patients want this done right. If you see some of these cases, like a distraction case that's shown here, these patients can go through multiple surgeries. I don't think they even realize how many surgeries that they've gone through sometimes. It's a shame. But can we do this in half the amount of surgeries with better, more, maybe it's a more complex design, but maybe 3D printing will allow for that more complex design where subtractive methods didn't allow. There are still unmet needs. We see complex cases, and surgeons that are in this audience and that we deal with to see these types of cases. And I think that what you want to see is the first step is, let, let's take a look at this on a computer screen. Let's, let's step back and take a plan. And there's some paradigm shifts here, right? Because uh, for like a trauma, trauma surgeon, they're used to just putting an x-ray up on the, on the screen and just looking at it and just deciding which nail or what hip to use. And I think it's something that is great opportunities for us to look at how can we change their thinking and how can digital imaging and uh, software and 3D printing allow for that type of planning in trauma and acute care. So I'd said this is a, a talk about benefits to the device company. Let's talk about it a little bit, right? So let's, what are some of the benefits? Well, we, we, the connection to the customer. We've had this from the beginning with patient-specific care and this is something we, we can continue. The, the first paragraph of our J&J credo is taking care of the surgeon and their patients and improving patient care. And so uh, this is an area where for these complex cases and with personalized care, we really take care of the outliers of the bell curve. These are the real complex cases. We're able to help these surgeons with their most complex situations and learning unmet needs that we could address maybe with standard solutions, more cost-effective solutions. And so it's, as we have this collaboration and communication, we're able to work together to come up with better solutions going forward. We have to continue to reduce cost to serve. And, and how we do this is really not just in the parts we make, but also in our inventory, the inventory of products, you know, go, moving from large consignment sets, lost, cons lost, lost waste from consignments, to smaller sets, personalized sets. They don't have to be patient-specific, just an anatomic set that can be pre-chosen, maybe with templating prior to surgery using advanced software. These are some technologies that, you know, that, that where you can maybe use 3D printing, but definitely digital simulation and planning. Last is improved logistics. I mean, there's many areas of the world that still do not get the right healthcare, and, and we can't get products that are fast enough. So two areas for logistics are, can we take care of the trauma and acute patient? Can we get product to them fast enough so that we, you can do the surgery right the first time, maybe within a day, hours before or after surgery? Second is in missions, areas of the world that just cannot get the treatment that they need can we provide, can 3D printers provide that solution for providing maybe a, a, an instrument or a set of instruments or a, a customized implant on a cost-effective manner so that that patient can go back to the village looking normal again? There's plenty of benefits for the hospital and the surgeon. And again, again we talked about just the pre-surgical decision-making, have making that decision, that communication, it's much more costly to make an error before surgery than it is during or after surgery. So make the error before if you can. Make, uh, optimize your, your, your plan going in and communicate. Use this as a communication tool. Not just for the OR staff, but for the patient. Make the patient more aware of what's going to happen to them so they're very comfortable with the next steps. And as uh, Brigitte said earlier, the, you're gonna, the patients are becoming more and more aware of the, their health care and, and the solutions that are available out there. 
Back to our value prop, efficiency and accuracy are very critical to this. We want to make sure that we continue to provide this level of accuracy. Hospitals are being judged on their quality control, and this is, this is directly impacting uh, reimbursement and how the payers treat them. And, and so it's going to be important for them to be able to manage this, and surgical planning uh, provides a tool for being able to inspect and kind of qual almost qualify this. And then the last is reduced inventory, similar to device manufacturers. You want to make sure that we don't have a lot of consignment products that with instruments and implants that are barely used, those outlier implants that are reprocessed about 100 times and sitting in, on shelves, which more, more risk and cost for, re, and for sterilization. Can we find ways to reduce this and partner together with hospitals to do that? So it's, it's not, these aren't all personalized care, right? This is, these are other solutions that we can look at using more templating, preoperative planning, as well as 3D printing. How about the patient? Patient sees benefit in this, right? So there's uh, you know, opportunities to be able to see uh, what the surgery is going to look like, the surgical steps, as well as sometimes post-operative imaging, what the, what the planned outcome may look like. Uh, and, and so it's, they can be more aware of what decisions they can make on their surgery, especially for those who are going to be out of pocket. They have a choice of personalized care. Having a solution that's kind of wrapped around their needs specifically versus having them uh, kind of adjust for a, a standard product. Out. And so in some cases, personalized care is the best solution for them, and it's, they have an option for that. Access and availability of product, I mentioned that before. P people that have, can't, just have not been able to get this type of medical treatment may have, be able to see this in remote locations, I and mean, just because of the uh, lower threshold and, and barrier for entry of these technologies and the digital imaging and digital transfer of this data, could we do these things remotely and be able to supply products uh, to patients who can't get it today? And less surgeries. I, I, I can't imagine the anxiety. I've never had surgery, uh, but I can't imagine the anxiety of going through surgery. And I can't imagine the anxiety of having, knowing that you're going to go through a third and a fourth surgery. So can we do this in less, and, and, and create less anxiety, less cost for these patients? So there's going to be a shift, right, in the business model. We've seen it already, especially in personalized care. Uh, I don't think you're going to get rid of products, right? But you're gonna, we're going to move a little bit to service. We're going to spend a little bit more time pre-surgically making plans and making decisions pre-surgically uh, and versus spending all the time waiting for product to come up from central processing and spending time in the operating room. Let's make the operating room the less, least amount of time and most efficient area and spend more time prior when the, where it's less costly. Expanded supply chain. Can we reach out beyond our, our walls with these device companies where we are no longer just having a couple manufacturing sites and large distribution centers where there's multiple centers you can provide products very quickly and cost effectively in a timely manner? And more, more involved before surgery, I mentioned that just kind of, again, we've seen this in orthognathic surgery where 3D printing is used for making splints. Surgeons hated making these cast molds and, and acrylics they, and, and using wax to kind of line up the teeth. Now they've gone to 3D printing for these and just the time savings. The challenge here is back is how do you, how do you get this, all this service reimbursed? And it's, it's not being put in the operating room. So that's a big paradigm shift of getting some of these services and technology that doesn't show up in the operating room uh, fully reimbursed. And lastly is just when you think you're fast enough. I've been doing this long enough that every time we think we're really fast, surgeon says we could be, if we did this a little faster, we'd be better for the patient. And it, you know, for like an oncology case, they want CT scan on a Monday and they want to do surgery on a Friday. So when it comes to 3D printing implants or surgical guides, we've had to kind of change our work stream to be able to meet that. And that, I'm, I'm assuming that's only going to keep getting faster and faster as there's a, 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 someone finds a way to treat patients better. So you know, how do we increase adoption? We want more people to use this. I think the first step is more regu regulated product, right? We have registered product. As we get more regulated product out in the market, we get more predicates, we have more controls, we, we understand the product that's out there. And so this is something you're starting to see. There's not a lot of predicates for the products we have. So I guess the first wave is always a little more challenging than, than the second. But I think it's, uh, there's opportunities to make uh, improvements here. Uh, Evidence, evidence, evidence. I think it's. I think just because it's 3D printed, not is. It's. Uh, it doesn't mean you should print it. I. Um, I had a. Uh, I got the 
sitting next to James Coburn from the FDA my last time I was here at the summit, and I, uh, we saw some images, and I said, just because you can 3D print it doesn't mean you should. And I think it's, we have to be very careful of what's printed. And I think going into hospitals, I don't care if it's a subtracted method or additive, we have to provide evidence, and I think even more here, uh, because there's some big differences. Uh, reduced costs. Machines are expensive, and material is pretty expensive as well. So I think as volumes go up, adoption goes up. If we want to do this remotely, I mean, there's a, there's a, there is a startup cost and a capital cost to do that. So to get more bureaus to do this and more, and more hospitals and sites to do this, again, the cost has to come down. IT has to keep up. Everything from data management, data transfer, as, and especially security of the data. As we get into, into further personalized care, we need to make sure that this data is secure, but it has to be accessible, and patients will be involved, right? They want to see some of this, and they're probably going to be looking at it on their wearables and on their iPhones going forward and communicating with doctors, just like you're seeing today. This is going to be important going forward. Manufacturing experience is something we've seen, especially in metals. Uh, it's, it's, you just can't have a vat of powder and then a machine and with a, a part and say, okay, it's going to print. There's, Every time we, uh, we, we change the design, there's enough variabilities where something goes wrong. More, the more and more experience we have, you'll see more exposure, uh, uh, more learning curves, and, and, and as well as uh, more advancement in, in procedures, qualifications, validations of the process. So this is a, an area where if we get more man manufacturing experience of these materials and these instruments and implants, the better we'll be and more adoption we'll be, have. And then it, lastly is more materials. Uh, we've seen tons of materials when it comes to uh, consumer, but medical uh, advances in uh, implantables, more implantable materials, those that resorb, those that can be more flexible, those that behave more like a scaffold or more like tissue and soft tissue. These are things that uh, uh, if we could advance these, we would, again, get more adoption and, and more use in other areas. Now, how about the future? Are we prepared for it? I mean, it's, still, it's coming pretty fast. I've, again, I've, I was at the summit like seven years ago, and I tell you, it's a lot different, this, this materialized summit, than the one I was at, that, that first one. So it was good to see the timetable from Freed earlier. So let, let's take a look at it. My belief is personalized kits. I think that the days of the big, large sets and these big, giant sets that show up in the op operating room for knee revision or for, or for spinal surgery are going to go bye-bye. I think it has to, I mean, it's, 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 it's very costly. There's in, implants and instruments that are, there that are never used, and there's risk for reprocessing, and there's opportunity for cost reduction in, in partnering with hospitals. Remote manufacturing, finding ways to get things faster. For us, we do a lot of trauma cases. How can we treat this large untapped area and, and, and really make a change. And sometimes it's not enough just to tell UPS we're going to ship it this next day. And so how can we get products to them faster and more efficiently? Again, we, we have to do this in a quality manner and a cost-effective manner. One of the uh, holy grails of CMF has been soft tissue simulation. Can we reverse plan? Can we look at the face and then plan backwards to the bone? And so uh, we, just, we really haven't reached it yet. And I think as we, we do what, good in moving bone, modeling bone, can we simulate soft tissue? Can we simulate the surgical pathway uh, and incisions as well as uh, any of the vasculature and you know, really kind of make this a real full surgical simulation. I think virtual reality and education programs have come a long way, and it's really helping out with universities and education. Can we do this on a personalized basis? Can we do this more as, uh, to, to improve patient care? And then patient tissue and bone, as you've seen some slides showing uh, the printing of bone and tissue. Uh, we've seen advances in scaffolds, uh, both in, in, in titanium and, and other resorbable materials. I think uh, as we go further, uh, why don't we just print bone and, it, and it, moving away from uh, just bone re cell rejection and issues for the pa that patient, being able to tell a patient, I don't have to take part of your fibula to reconstruct your mandible, I'm just going to regrow that mandible with something else. And so these are advances that, that, that put them f moving forward. And someone mentioned earlier about moving someone in, up in line for a, a organ transplant. And you know, someone asked me in my company, is this going to meet a clinical need? And I said, I think it's really going to meet a clinical need when you can do that. If you can re actually move somebody way up in line for an organ transplant, that's a great opportunity. So let's, uh, let's close by saying, how do we get there? And so what's the next steps to kind of make that leap? And uh, we've seen a lot in standard creation, especially for healthcare and, and, and me metallic materials. It took a long time to do it and get, get to where we need to be when it comes to those standards. 
let's leverage what we've used, uh, we learned already for metals as we get into more advanced materials beyond uh, this lookalikes of the wrought materials and make sure we can uh, shorten the time to get those materials qualified. Uh, secure data transfer and storage are gonna be key uh, going forward as we share information remote, for remote locations, collaborating with surgeons and hospitals. I use the term black box printer because it's, uh, I, I believe some people, not all, believe that when you print something on a 3D printer, it comes out and you can use it. It's, it's done, it's ready to go. And that's not always the case. I think as you'll see more adoption as uh, companies can start to develop a printer that you can do a lot more within that printer. I think it's, you'll see some efficiencies, especially for just uh, resources, uh, logistics, as well as having to have large, smaller sized buildings and footprints. Uh, we'll continue to harp on evidence. We will not do this without evidence. We need to make sure that it provides not only clinical benefit, but also value to the hospital. Just like anything we do, whether it was a subtractive method or additive, this is, is going to be important. And we've had very good collaboration with the regulatory bodies going forward, and that has to continue. I think they've helped us with some of the guidance documents thus far, and I think as we get advanced beyond metals and other areas where we're going to, we don't really have a lot of uh, predicate devices, it's going to be even more important for us to have this kind of collaboration. As you can see, I'm pretty excited about where we've ended up with 3D printing and how it's taken us this far in personalized space, but I'm even more excited of the potential that these technologies would provide device manufacturers to help surgeons treat their patients in a better way. I want to thank you all for your time.